हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते सलाम गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू हु हैव जॉइंड फ्रॉम डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड दिस इज शोभा शुक्ला एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस वर्कशॉप एट द एशिया पैसिफिक पीपल्स फोरम 2021 व्हिच इज बीइंग हेल्ड ऑनलाइन दिस ईयर ऑन अ वर्चुअल प्लेटफार्म ड्यू टू द कोविड-19 पेंडेमिक व्हिच एज वी ऑल नो has once again exposed the fragilities and inequities of our health systems this workshop on no excuse for inaction on health security if we are to deliver on development justice in asia pacific is organized by cns under the theme of people's priorities for development justice unpacking the goals and addressing systemic barriers to reclaim people's rights The workshop is also being streamed live on the Facebook page of CNS. Failure to prevent non-communicable diseases and failure to prevent every new case of infectious diseases like tuberculosis and now COVID-19 is defeating us on the sustainable development goals or SDGs as they are known as. Corporations are capturing decision making processes in health policies and expanding their markets at the cost of endangering our lives this workshop will help us understand why health security and health justice is one of the essential components of development justice and it will also delve upon the successes and challenges across the region in advancing health for all a few quick housekeeping announcements Uh, participants and panelists please keep yourself muted when not speaking please feel free to type in your questions and comments in the chat box even as speakers present and we will take them up during the course of the workshop without any further ado i now invite our first speaker professor dr rishi sethi a renowned cardiologist he will share with us an overview of where we are on preventing non communicable diseases and the impact of covid-19 on them over to you dr sethi eminent members of the panel colleagues ladies and gentlemen i wish you all a very good afternoon from india i thank the organizers and especially cns for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all about my point of views of the care of ncd in modern times especially covid times and um, so when i look back over this last one year it fills me with a certain sense of frustration bordering anger because all of us that have been involved in the management of uh, various diseases covid and otherwise have been so so much engrossed in our attention for the care of covid and this pandemic that had hit the mankind that we had somehow lost track of other diseases that the humanity is suffering from and unfortunately now as the year is ending we are seeing a lot of frustration and anger being built up in the patients of cardiovascular diseases renal diseases malignancies about how they have been unfairly treated during covid times so when we look back so when we look at the pre covid times we realize that it was the non communicable diseases that were killing more than 80% of people across world they were cause of 80% mortality and what happened during covid time was that between march and may that was um, the peak of covid crisis all across the western world everyone saw that there was an increase in the overall mortality in these western countries to the tune of 50 to 100% and this was coinciding with the peak of covid crisis so it was a natural conclusion that was drawn that you know covid probably will emerge as the leading cause of mortality worldwide and it has potential to wipe off a vast section of humanity so all our resources and justifiably so were focused on covid care and for the next 8 to 9 months or or one year time we focused on this specific crisis and have largely contained it Uh, as far as the world is concerned over the some areas are seeing a second peak but overall the crisis seemed to have been managed pretty effectively but when we take 
an overall comparative picture between COVID and non-COVID diseases, we realized that out of 150,000 deaths that happen in the world every single day, one third of them, that is around 50,000, are because of cardiovascular diseases. Around 26,000 are because of malignancies. Another around 17,000 are because of respiratory diseases and diabetes, liver diseases, road traffic accidents, kidney diseases, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, suicides, all individually contribute to around 2,000 to 4,000 deaths out of these 150,000 deaths per day. And their contribution individually is around two to 4,000 deaths. Now, when we compared it to the COVID mortality, we saw that even during peak of crisis in various countries, uh, and when we compare the global figures in combination, we saw that COVID was killing anywhere between 2,000 to 6,000 patients uh, per, per day uh, as compared to these other diseases. So we realized that, uh, we also realized that as far as the leading cause of mortality was concerned, if we focus our attention on Southeast Asia, uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 was anywhere between 10th and the 100th most common cause of death, even during corona time. So we have to realize that the hard facts that we have learned is no matter what crisis the world is facing in the healthcare, the mortality caused by cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, malignancies, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, road traffic accidents, suicides still remains higher. And whenever we are faced with any other second pandemic or any other crisis, we cannot lose our sight of the care of the patients suffering from these diseases, because if we do so, then we will be causing more harm and more mortality overall as compared to, um, as compared to the normal days, because, because they would be, they, these diseases when left untreated or left unattended would be highly lethal as compared to when they are managed effectively. So <clears throat> I'm a cardiologist based in the city of Lucknow uh, in the northern part of India. And we were a tertiary care hospital, one of the largest hospitals in Asia, draining a large part of North India and even some parts of adjoining country of Nepal. And when COVID crisis hit us, we converted ourselves into a largely a COVID hospital, but of course we were also giving non-COVID care. And we realized from our experience in cardiology that the kind of non-COVID care that we were providing was highly, highly inadequate. We shut down our outpatients for a large part of this year. Every day outpatients in our cardiology is to the tune of anywhere between 400 to 600 patients. All these patients were left unattended. Very few of them received telecommunication or teleconsultation. Um, but then most part of most of these patients were left unattended and that brought a lot of sense of frustration and anger in the patient, dissatisfaction in the patient, those patients who have been treated previously with, with angioplasties, with pacemakers, did not receive care. And this was the situation with, with the renal diseases, they could not receive dialysis. This was a situation with malignancies, they could not receive their chemotherapies, radiotherapies and trying, so there was a sense of frustration. And I give this cardiology statistics because in the eight months of COVID, we saw the figures that we saw here appear to be large in terms of when we compared to other hospitals in COVID care facilities. But I can assure you that we were seeing and we were treating more than five times patients in non-COVID times. And those, those, four those, those patients or 80 percent patients who were not treated, this really had the poorer outcomes. And we see those poorer outcomes now. So now as the fire of COVID is setting down a little bit, I can say with a little bit of caution, we also have to see that overall in the healthcare sector, especially looking at the NCD, our house is completely on fire and we have to utilize all the resources at our disposal. disposal. We have to come to a common consensus uh, with a common wisdom, how to treat and what is the way forward, how to treat the non-communicable diseases, how to prepare for the second pandemic whenever it comes, second crisis whenever it comes, and how can we treat that crisis and simultaneously lose, not lose track of the bigger house on fire that is the non-communicable diseases. I believe the COVID-19 pandemic is the real sense global crisis that had hit the mankind after Second World War with similar kind of strategies so as to believe that every person on this planet either directly has an or indirectly has been affected by the crisis. Similar was the case in Second World War. 
it poses us similar challenges and at the same point of time, similar opportunities, because why I say opportunity is because it has shaken from its complacency, the political class, the bureaucratic class, the, the entrepreneurs, the healthcare system, everybody it has shaken from complacency. We have been forced to think of new innovative ways to survive in the present and a more better and a comfortable way to survive in the future. So this shaking up of complacency, what the second world war was did, I mean, a lot of, lot of progress of the mankind that happened in the 20th century happened because of the lessons we learned from the second world war. So the lessons that we learned from COVID-19 pandemic will that has shaken us from complacency will help us plan better in times to come, plan more innovatively in times to come, plan a more transitional part of the research in times to come. So there's not all is not lost. There is certainly a way forward. And I believe that meetings like today's meeting will help come at a common consensus, will bring us back to the drawing table and help us renew our plans to tackle diseases, especially non-communicable diseases in times to come. It will require a larger coordination between government agencies, academicians, organizations that have been involved with the healthcare system. We have to come to a consensus where the allocation of resources is not based upon rhetorics and vote banks, but it is based upon um, hard requirements, both economic resources as well as the human resources have to be allocated according to the severity of the disease and according to the need. We have to plan for both short terms in terms of therapeutic interventions, as well as long term over the next 10 to 20 years over a term of preventive strategies in healthcare plan. And we have to really free ourselves from the clutches of the industry and economic consideration. And we have to rely on healthcare that is based on the evidence-based medicine in terms of common consensus wisdom with patients and societies in mind rather than individuals, individuals in mind. I thank you for your attention and I wish you best for all your remaining part of the meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Sethi. And as you have rightly said, it is not about prioritizing one of your diseases over the others, but learning to ride perhaps many horses at the same time for overall health equity through meaningful and sustainable coordinations between different agencies to douse the fire which is upon our house. And who better to talk about this than Kate Lappin, Regional Secretary for the Asia and Pacific Region at Public Services International. Welcome, Kate. Uh, Kate, you are a strong votary and passionate believer in a feminist fossil fuel free future, and rightly so. Can you please elaborate on why and how health justice is an integral part of development justice? Thanks, Shobha. Um, I can see my image is getting a little odd. I'm flickering in and out. I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to share my screen and I have a bit of a presentation. Yes, please. Um, the, I think, I mean, my, I'm going to talk a bit more uh, broadly about a range of issues relating to health, the pandemic, but particularly around um, the macroeconomics of health or the political economy of health in the current crisis, but also the, I think some of the drivers um, that have exposed us more to the pandemic than, than needed to be. Um, I, PSI, just for those that might not be aware, um, PSI is the global union that represents public unions in the public sector, the largest of which is um, the health sector. So our affiliates, oops, sorry, I'm trying to present here and it is going a little wrong. Um, yeah, so our affiliates represent workers who deliver health, but also care, for example, in the aged care sector or disability care, um, and in other forms of, of care, as well as the other public services, whether that be utilities, electricity, water, um, local government, public administration, waste collection, etc. So I'm focusing a little bit on uh, the, the issues that have presented themselves both to workers, but also 
uh, to public services and we're a bit different to other global unions in that our mandate is both about advancing the rights of workers who deliver public services, but also to protect public services, expand um, and ensure that we have stronger quality, gender responsive quality public services for all. Um, so let me, I've called this uh, health financialization making a killing, but um, I'm actually going to deal with a few different areas that I think are relevant right now. So first of all, I think, as I said, I think that the pandemic has, has been exacerbated by um, neoliberalism, but also for many, it's been an illustration of why the current model um, needs to be challenged and why, when, as we build back, we need to obviously look at other approaches. First of all, in many countries in this region, but also around the world, um, the, the disease was spread often because of the precarious nature of, for a lot of workers, those who were not able to isolate, those who had to work in lots of different settings, and sometimes that was in the health setting. So health workers, obviously, and care workers were exposed uh, more than others, often to the virus. And if they needed to work across settings, that obviously was an enormous risk to the public as well as to workers. Um, we can see that privatisation and the, the systemic erosion of pu public services over time made healthcare inaccessible for many. And of course, if for those uh, people who weren't able to go and easily access a test or who were worried that they um, would have to pay, didn't, and it's another way that a virus is spread. Um, but we also know that many people weren't able to access care, the diet at home, many figures are misleading because those who weren't able to go into uh, hospitals for care weren't counted. And this is obviously a huge um, injustice for, for the poorest who weren't able to access care. But we also know that at the beginning, particularly at the beginning of the crisis, when all countries were looking for PPE and for different types of treatments, we, it was clear that it was in, most countries had given up um, production because all production had been chasing the lowest possible costs or lowest possible wages, and that very few countries were left with a supply source locally. As countries shut their borders and prioritised their own needs, then they were left without adequate PPE and there was then an inflated prices. Um, and I'm going to also touch a little bit more on why I think the trade rules made us all far more vulnerable and continue to do so. Um, now, just in case I don't get my get time to sort of really wrap up, I wanted to position this, as you said, Shoba, in the context of what's needed in terms of development justice. So I think this is an opportunity, as our previous speaker said, this crisis I think does also present an opportunity. It means that we can rethink what kind of economies, what uh, we want and what we think an economy should do. And of course, that it should be built around care, the capacity to care. And I totally agree that that's not simply about dealing with COVID or future um, pandemics, but it's more broadly about the right to health and the right to care and how can we build a robust public system that um, ensures that all forms of, um, of health risks are assessed and that people can receive care, as well as that we can ensure that all people can receive, that can um, access decent work. I and mean, then at the same time, I think uh, this is an opportunity to decarbonise our economies. And as you said, um, in terms of a fossil fuel, feminist fossil fuel free future, there's a clear link between health care and um, decarbonised economies. The more we centre our economies around the capacity to care, the, you know, that's, that's a low carbon part of our economy. And at the same time, we know that climate change is going to present more and more uh, health crises. Um, ranging, including new types of diseases or diseases that will spread more rapidly, but also the, the disasters. So I do think it's linked in. 
Um, and those together will make societies more equitable and democratic and more resilient to new crises. But that will require us to look at how the existing rules of economies are um, limiting our capacity to do that. So let me start a bit about, I mentioned private equity and the privatisation of care and health. Um, it might have seemed that, you know, with a number of countries looking at the dangers of privatised health, in some countries, parts of the health system were taken over by governments where they were clearly failing, where in a lot of countries we saw aged care facilities being the, the centre of the epidemic um, of the virus. And um, we, and in some countries, the government stepped in and took over those um, centres. That was similar also in where we saw private hospitals not adequately dealing with the pandemic and the not, um, you know, and, only looking for the, the most cost-effective um, way to respond. And in some cases, government stepped in and took, uh, took over some elements of private hospitals. But in fact, that also masked the, the, the bigger picture, which was 2020 was actually saw the uh, increase in private equity taking over elements of health. So the, it had the highest number of... Um, private equity deals. So that's, you know, where uh, non-health finances, often, you know, large funds would come in and buy up health uh, services, different types of health services. And for the first time, the largest growth was in Asia, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and this is really alarming if we think about, it's, this is all about increasing profits. It's not, you know, it's not about a new, private hospital perhaps opening because a local entrepreneur or something has decided that there's a need. It's all, it's, it's non-health finance buying up health because of their analysis that there's higher profits to be made at the, in the future in health. Um, so that's a, a major risk and something that I think hasn't been adequately addressed is the, is the growth in the private, private equity market in our health systems. At the same time, there's been extensive research done um, during COVID and as, as well as before about what the risks are if we uh, are dependent on private health. And so this particular research focuses on Europe, but I think it's illustrative and could easily be represented or replicated around the region. Um, it showed that greater privatisation of healthcare raises the rate of COVID prevalence and mortality across all countries that they studied. So if there, oops, sorry, if there's a 10% um, increase in private health expenditure in a country, it leads to 4.3% increase in COVID cases and a 4.9% increase in COVID-related mortality. The, if that was 20%, it would lead to 86 um, and so forth. So there's a large correlation between the, the role of um, private health and mortality. Um, similarly, we know that in, in uh, areas, for example, age care or the care, disability care, care areas where there's long-term care needs and not emergency care or um, and primary or tertiary care at the hospital level, uh, that that privatised care has been riskier for, for the residents. So um, when the private equity moved in, this is one study prior to the pandemic, when private equity took over care, it, related, it resulted in um, a 10% increase in mortality. And this is just um, you know, other causes of death, which over the period of time was 20,000 people who had who prematurely died. Um, and at the same time, there's other major negative outcomes, for example, um, in this case, lower mo mobility. In others, it's been high, an increased number of falls by elderly people, for example. But also, surprisingly, you would think that with that decline in the quality of care, there might be a cost saving, but at the same time, there was an increase um, in public spending by 11% when the private 
equity came into care. Um, another study, though, did show that if the if a if care or if a healthcare or long-term care settings are unionised, there's a 30% reduction in mortality. And so obviously there's often a correlation in many countries between um, private equity and de-unionisation. So where there's a, a desire to maximise profits, one way to do that is to have precarious workers, uh, less unionised workers, and obviously lower paid workers. Um, and as I said, this the corporatization, corporatization or financialization of care has been increasing over time. Um, these companies, this is a complex map, and I don't expect people to read it, but this is an example of the way that Bupa has set itself up in one country to create a complex web of the way that um, payments for care go through various channels and um, to basically end up in tax havens. So our care is being financialized to the point that really the, the for the um, care providers to maximize profit, maximize profits, to extract that park it in, in tax havens, um, find extensive and complex ways to not make that public or to um, you know to 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 ensure that the money isn't exposed even for things like wage claims. Um, and some of that is actually in, in private pension, in pension funds or private and public pension funds. So workers' money itself is being used in these ways to buy up care systems, to park that money in tax havens, to ask governments for more money, saying that they can't afford to provide quality care and this is why the you know, mortality is higher, et cetera and then um, reduce wages at the same time in conditions. Um, I should say as well that, you know, I think in most, in many of these countries, is a, the workers are often migrant workers and um, they're working across sites and aren't, you know, it's, we can't blame the workers for the, the lack of quality of care when they don't get any time to really spend time with people, you know, in these long-term care um, environments. Um, so instead of using these care systems where private equity is, is placed in um, tax havens, we really need to reform these tax systems, both, of, both for care as well as for um, other corporate practices. And if we did that, we could, it could lead to significant increases in, the, in health budgets. Another area I wanted to highlight that's I think a, a major risk at the, um, at the moment and has been increasing during the pandemic is the big tech takeover of care and health. Health has been regarded um, by some of the, the larger tech companies as the um, largest area for potential growth. So Samsung, for example, has identified you know, the, the, net, the area that they see large growth for their business is actually in provision of health. They already own a range of hospitals, but they're looking also at forms of telehealth or um, digital diagnostics and other forms of digitalized health. Now, of course, some I'm not suggesting that we don't need any you know, new technologies in health or that there's not a range of benefits from um, digitalized data, but it's, a risk to have that all held by the private sector and for the purpose of it to be uh, profits. So we need to look at other ways to use technologies in the public system and that the, that the data is kept in the public system and not used um, for further profits. Uh, the big risk here being that when private big tech provides health services um, or digital health services, they then can financialize that health data and which is increasingly genetic data and they can financialize that on sell it. Um, and then all of the data we need for public health is actually in private hands. Governments would have to buy that back. We, we can't guarantee, there's all sorts of trade rules that would restrict um, governments from being able to um, access 
those that data. And you can see that those digital companies are very much pushing for that data to be um, to remain in the hands of big tech. So this quote, there's a senior official from Google um, who called for the deregulation of all artificial intelligence-based healthcare. So that deregulation meaning governments can't regulate to the extent to which um, artificial intelligence can uh, operate in healthcare. Um, and this is done through trade agreements where these companies are promoting new rules at the WTO, but also in trade agreements, at bilateral or uh, plurilateral trade agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement or the, um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, where they want to ensure that they, that health data is um, a type of service, not, 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 uh, not excluded from trade rules. And that um, that would mean that they that governments are not allowed, won't get access to the algorithms that health um, diagnostics uses, that, that these kind of companies don't need to keep this data in the country, that they don't have to have a local presence, for example. So it's really a completely deregulated space. Um, in a, at the moment, one of the biggest areas in relation to health and trade that I thought I'd touch on is also in relation to intellectual property. We know that um, right now, the India and South Africa have promoted a waiver so that the rules that, that stop governments from being able to produce the medicines or the treatments that might be needed for COVID um, are restricted under trade rules because they're, they're entirely owned by uh, the private sector, even though they've been developed with public sector funding. And India and South Africa have now been joined by the majority of countries in the world to say that we should waive those provisions and say that now this crisis needs all countries to have access to um, the, the vaccine and the potential to produce that vaccine. Um, but instead what these rules do, and I should say this TRIPS agreement, which is the World Trade Organization's um, agreement that relates to intellectual property, was partially drafted and, uh, by big pharmaceutical companies. Um, and Pfizer has gone on record to say how pleased they were with the role they played in drafting these rules and how beneficial it's been to um, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it, in addition to the crisis we're facing at the moment, it really does um, shift the nature of medical research. It means that all research goes into really those areas that um, are most profitable. Um, and vaccines are actually not that not profitable because they're preventative. And so no vaccine has been developed without public spending, without public um, money to, to go into um, either, pro either public research or private research, but it's still dependent on private money and public money. So. Um, and this really means that other diseases or diseases that, in, that are more experienced by low income people don't end up uh, being prioritised. If we put, or if the idea is that um, profits are what incentivises uh, medical treatment, medical research and medical production of new medicines, uh, of course, it, there are a range of long-term diseases that are excluded. Um, and as, as you said earlier, um, NCDs are the biggest health risk, but they aren't seen as a priority um, in the, and within the, the, um, this system of a profit-based or incentive to produce treatments. Um, but any regulations there on the prevention, for example, things that where we might see things like, you know, um, food labeling or um, bans on, on dangerous goods, um, could be trade barriers. Um, so as I said, Big Pharma wrote those rules and now they're, they're trying to protect those rules even in light of the vaccine. And this is part of the campaign. It's 
uh, a range of countries supporting it, very few countries opposing it. But I just wanted to encourage everybody to be part, to, to join that campaign to, uh, to support the TRIPS flavour so that vaccines can be produced wherever without um, needing to pay, negotiate payments with Big Pharma. Um, now, I'm mo moving quickly onto uh, the pressures that governments have to privatise. Obviously, privatisation is happening as, as we've seen, and that's been both through uh, the investments that the you know, private sector is constantly looking for um, and through the rules, but, of, but governments could have options to, to invest much more in, the pub, in public health. Unfortunately, many governments uh, historically, but particularly now that they've taken on more debt, are pressured through their relationship with the International Monetary Fund or other lending um, from the other banks uh, to reduce their public spending. And this is a chart of where the International Monetary Fund is encouraging countries to reduce their, um, their public sector wage bills. So it's extraordinary that countries in the region, they are already the lowest percentage of GDP uh, goes to public sector wage bills and all evidence for a robust public health system and broader uh, public system to provide all of the public services we require to live a life with dignity are that you do need a higher percentage of public sector um, spending. And in terms of wage bills, that might be around 12%, something around that. Um, but yet the IMF is still encouraging a number of countries either to freeze their existing wage bills or to reduce them. And from the region, just point out here, for example, Nepal has only a 3.1% GDP to public se sector wage bills. And the IMF is suggesting that should go down one, one point. Um, India is already extremely low, one of the lowest um, in the world at 1.1. And the suggestion is to, free, is to maintain that and freeze that, not, not um, bring it up. So there, there is a, lo a lot of inconsistency as well. Sometimes they say for country, a country like Cambodia, which is 7.5, that, you know, it's, that could go up. But there's a lot of countries in the region where privatisation, where health, particularly health privatisation, is already prevalent and already disastrous. And the IMF is, is either encouraging them to stay there or to, um, or to reduce the amount of public spending on those public sector wages. Um, and that obviously has huge ramifications for all, but particularly for women. And we've got a range of studies. I've just cited one here that shows that when privatisation of health is increased, women's access to a range of um, health needs is reduced, particularly sexual and reproductive health, but um, also other um, health needs to do with NCDs and so forth. Um, and we know that in, I just wanted to very quickly touch on in South Asia, the whole public health system is dependent on the on extremely uh, well not unpaid usually unpaid community health workers. In India, it's one million workers, and across Pakistan, Nepal, um, there's, the public system does depend on these women. Um, and now, really, should be the time, given that they have played such a critical role during the pandemic, to increase the public sector wages. The, public sector um, overall wage bill so that these women could be recognised as workers and paid. And the research we've done from Pakistan, where once those women unionised and really ran a campaign, they were able to secure a, a, the right to a wage, is that it has huge flow on effects for their family, their community, uh, particularly girls, that the number of community health workers who once were paid were able to get their girls an education it was um, the, one of the most remarkable things in the study. And so I wanted to just point out that these workers have come, come together across, a num across Nepal, South, uh, sorry, India 
and uh, Pakistan to put together a charter of demands in the context of um, the pandemic. And they're seeking support from civil society for those demands, but also trying to demonstrate that the big international agencies that do impact on government spending, like the IMF, World Bank, ADB, others, need to um, lift their restrictions or their advice to restrict public sector wages and recognise that uh, they are a critical part of the health system. Um, I won't go through, I think I'm probably running out of time, so I won't go through all of the areas that we see at needing to make a change in these COVID recovery plans. But the last thing I just wanted to mention, it's a part of a campaign we just launched um, two days ago, which is about the rebuilding the social organisation of care. And so really thinking about what is it that we would do uh, through the COVID recovery plans to put care at the centre to make care public, um, but also to recognise that the burden of care is, has entirely or primarily been on women in many cases, which the uh, pandemic has exacerbated. And part of this is actually to, to campaign for a new right to understand um, that we have a human right to care, to receive care, as well as, of course, to give care and have that care that's given um, valued. And this campaign, um, which is, you can have a look more, there's a manifesto on our website where we're looking now for other organisations who would uh, support the campaign for care. So I'll leave it there. I know I've covered a lot of areas um, and yeah, I hope that, that um, others can contribute to this discussion. Thank you very much, Kate. And there was, you had pointed this out in your presentation, but there is a comment and question from Soumya Gupta, uh, who's saying that a lot of healthcare workers are contractual and many of them get only performance-based incentive as is happening in India as well, which is, which, and that too is often delayed by months. And they are the first ones to be laid off suddenly. So are, are they also included in unions of healthcare workers? You have touched upon this uh, in your presentation, but would you like to respond to this? Sure, yes. I mean, um, uh, certainly we very much um, encourage our affiliates to unionise the most precarious workers, and that's where we see the priority. Um, and I think that that's exactly what we, what we want to um, expose, is that the the precarious nature of health workers is actually puts everybody at risk and we need to make sure that everybody has all health workers have secure work and in the long term it will be you know key to our long-term resilience but as i said in terms of the community health workers themselves who are have been you know obviously part of the most precarious in the health system they also have included in their charter of demands timely payments so for those that are paid like in pakistan they're not always paid on time and some months um, for months haven't been paid but also those who are dependent only on the tiniest of honorariums they all even those honorariums haven't been paid in many cases and um the women are very much at risk that are often at the front lines, often look at, you know, having to go door to door to, um, you know, to consult with people who are likely um, or having been infected with COVID and so forth. So they're extremely vulnerable, but, but not paid. And when they're paid, when they have got some pay, not paid on time. So absolutely agree with the question. That this is a priority and in the long term we we need to unionize um, all of those workers and push for conditions where no health worker no care worker is precarious okay thank you thank you very much kate and as kate has rightly pointed out the current neoliberal model of development has failed and the covid 19 pandemic has once again exposed that privatization of healthcare is actually exasperating illnesses and mortality. And so I think a feminist approach is crucial to develop on health justice and have ecologically sustainable and socially just health systems. 
women we know comprise 70% of the world's poor the consume the least are paid the least and own the least yet they pay the highest price in terms of bearing the brunt of natural disasters as well as public health emergencies and therefore only i repeat only a feminist fossil fuel free future can lead to sustainable development feminism is about using care and solidarity to change systems and to share and redistribute power as against patriarchy which is about using power and violence against other people in order to gain more power so it is about sharing with others and caring for others what feminism is about and this is so integral to health equity and universal health coverage i now invite bobby ramakan from cns and asha parivar to tell us about how corporations are impacting health security and proving a major threat to sustainable development goals yeah thank you shobha and uh, uh, well one of the good advantages of uh, to speak after kate and shobha is that uh, and rishi of course uh, is that you know there's very little for me to say so my job is really easy and i will not bore you all with a lot and these are very important points which you heard from rishi rishi also being a senior cardiologist he pointed out to say, you know of the uh, indicated on what industry is doing we need to you know stay uh, you know, to, to the health you we heard from kate Uh, and her title was so bang on spot on health financialization uh, and it is making a killing and making a killing reminded me of a important documentary i was uh, happened to be i am on the board of corporate accountability and corporate accountability was involved with the documentary making a killing 22 years back by academy award winning and please do a team which please do see that and that was about how philip morris craft and which was like a food company etc like they were connected and uh, it was based on documents which were recovered from a tobacco industry world's largest cigarette company philip morris um offices uh, which were raided uh, by a court order in uh, late 90s so a very powerful one and i will share a link in the chat box and you know you be heard from kate that many people died at home many people died without care why even before the pandemic even before we heard from rishi that the world's biggest killer cardiovascular diseases you know many we are talking of the fortunate few who happen to reach the cardiac or heart centers in countries like india many people are dying or many people are are suffering or they develop conditions which they should not have developed in the first place let think of tuberculosis we know how to prevent tuberculosis transmission we know how to diagnose tuberculosis we know how to treat tuberculosis successfully this there is no reason no excuse for even a single death from tuberculosis or any of the preventable disease diseases for instance only if sharing caring and we only if human life is at the center if people at this are at the center of the response you will with then only this is possible but why is it not happening you know what because corporations are telling the governments that they are also people in 2010 the U- corporations in the U- you know the us supreme court order which was thankfully I, if i if i'm correct uh, uh, it was reversed uh, but in 2010 they got a favorable order where corporations were treated at the same as equal to the people are they equal to the people just think about this think of the biggest corporations as kate rightly pointed out that which are bigger than even the economies of the countries corporations what you know the the only bottom line for all the corporations is profit legally also they are accountable to the shareholders every quarter so it is all about profit and and it is def- and uh, as kate pointed out when we increase invest in public sector when we in, in public services the mortality goes down the you even the, when we invest in union unionization of public services we saw the mortality and the going down the care going up and we saw such positive responses and what are corporations doing corporations not on what were the rules government are supposed to have, to have rules to regulate the corporations but you we have so many examples where corporations are trying to write those rules they're trying to write the rules look at the you know how big food is involved with uh, with the food 
policies that regulate uh, the the food industries or how pharmaceutical companies are involved with the with policies and regulations uh, involved uh, you know with that and kate rightly pointed out that uh, the for example the lot of covid 19 research happened in public health sector the national institute of virology in india for instance where, where uh, then it was handed over to bharat biotech but not national institute of virology is a government owned indian council of medical research institute where the research happened in the public sector so look at the tobacco control you know like we, this is it's in entirely we will hear dr tara singh bam very very quickly and i will not be, you know take too much of time on tobacco control because dr tara singh bam has been saying it repeatedly that tobacco control is an entirely preventable epidemic we do not have to deal with this covid 19 is enough of a challenge and we already before the pandemic we had a huge challenge in confronting our health systems major, and major burden is of preventable diseases which are caused by lot of risk factors or uh, of which are propelled by the corporations i will just quickly try to point out that even in india you know a few years back the the uh, the i think it was 2019 when when uh, the rules was changed so that corporations earlier i think it was 7.5% of their annual turnover or something corporations can donate to a political party but in, then the rules were rewritten by electoral bonds where they can give unlimited amount of money to elector to political party but at the same time they uh, you know they, they are not accountable it is not transparent so uh, as a citizen i will not be i have, have no way to find out how much co money corporations have been uh, have funded uh, in the you know to to different political parties so they're not only trying to write the rules but they're also trying to pick the pick the people who will be actually uh, you know uh, should be accountable to the people in in a democracy which i live in right now so uh, we will hear from uh, dr bam and other other speakers as well but uh, i just wanted to raise two important things one is about ensuring that to the industry is out of public policy that is a very important demand which should be in every sector whether it is health or it is or we talk of workers rights or we talk of um, you know any other issue industry cannot be writing those rules we need to have those policies right in place Uh, to to not let industry interfere with the policy public policy making or at any in any other uh, way even surrogate the second is to hold them legally and financially liable that is extremely important and it both of these go together to kick the industry out to and to make them pay so uh, and without any further ado i will uh, pass it on to back to shubha thank you thank you bobby and as you have rightly pointed out kicking out industry and preventing it from interfering in public health policies and holding it liable and we have we have international treaties like international the who fctc framework convention on tobacco control and we have the sdgs now which have set the goal, uh, the global agenda for a healthier world but then again it is equally important that action on the ground at local and national level helps us achieve these global goals so now i invite dr tara singh bam director for asia pacific international union against tuberculosis and lung health and the guiding force behind asia pacific cities alliance for health and development or apcat as it is called to share with us what are the commercial determinants of health and how can local action help advance health for all in the asia pacific region and prevent industry interference for control of ncds tb and tobacco use over to you dr bam yes dr bam sorry uh, thank you yes. thank you so uh, thank you thank you very much for your nice introduction i think uh, i just say uh, you know i was listening to the speakers and you so uh, and bobby uh, first of all i would like to really thanks to 
to the organizers, to CNS, for inviting me to speak in this uh, very important uh, session. Uh, just I, uh, let me share my screen just to highlight the, some key facts you know, the, that we have uh, at, at this moment. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can, yes. Excellent, thank you. So just to, uh, you know, uh, if we look at the overall, uh, the, the problem that we are facing currently, and we are talking about health. Uh, when we say the health, actually it starts from the, you know, from home to the and community, neighborhood, school, our workplaces, public places, at the at subnational level, national level, international level, you know, it's all about health. And it determines by various, the various factors, like uh, our socioeconomic factors, our the educational factor, our, you know, social factors, the, the, there are many right uh, uh, based, you know, the, the factors, and also we know these commercial factors as well. So there are many factors, you know, that we, some we need definitely, some factors that needs to be well regulated, some factors needs to be improved, some factors needs to be addressed uh, at any level, whether it's at the household level or at the, at the even more, more than household level. So there are many ways to really determine our health. And I have also the responsibility to determine a good health for my and the family members. So my family members has also the res responsibility to really determine a good health for me and the other members as well. So it's a shared responsibility to create a healthy environment and to create a healthy population. So in this context, uh, I would like to just you know the, uh, point out more on the thing is uh, on commercial determinants of health. Yes, in one hand, we are facing big, uh, you know, challenge uh, or the in a socio-economic sectors. In other hands, the commercial sector. And now the uh, the whole world, if you look at even in the COVID-19, the commercial, you know, the the agents, I would say, you know, are more powerful to really influence the policies uh, yeah, for COVID-19 and also for other health programs as well. So uh, the key, uh, uh, the issue, like uh, Bobby also mentioned earlier, whether we treat, you know, all these big uh, the, the, uh, determinants, let's say the big tobacco, big alcohol, big soda, big food, uh, you know, whether we treat them as, a, as uh, you know, equally as other people, or uh, whether they are that they have the, uh, you know, the, any uh, uh, the right to say about the health or whether the government should make the equal some sort of the regulation to treat these are bigger uh, the companies and also the, the health of the people. Of course not. There should be a clear distinction and the governments must have to pay the attention to really see the difference between the people's health and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the industry or the companies. So uh, why I'm saying here, if you, uh, you all know about this, the big tobacco kills a, over 8 million people each year at the global level. So the deaths is not happening in, you know, for last year, it's happening for decades. We know this. And we are just uh, you know, the, the witness of these deaths. But these deaths can be prevented. So I can take some responsibility, definitely, as, as an individual. As, but everyone should take this uh, the responsibility, and everyone should be the accountable to to this death. Similarly, the big uh, alcohol, you know, the, uh, is also kills over three million people each year. I don't need to explain the you know the, the consequences of you know consuming all these products. The uh, uh, doctor, you know, the lady already mentioned in his presentation, and the earlier speaker also I will highlight it. Similar like big soda and big foods, they are also major killers. Uh, now they're contributing you know, over 11, 11 million death each year. So it's a huge, it's a huge loss. It's a huge 
human loss is a huge economy loss is a huge our you know the societal loss so it but you know the the government knows about this the civil society knows about this debt the we uh, as a professional we know about this media also everybody knows uh, the the issues but uh, where are the action when you look at the, the action from the industry side they are well connected to the any policy maker whether they are at the national level or sub national level or at the community level and they have very powerful their front group and they mobilize to you know those front group to influence the policy as government rightly mentioned earlier and they they know how to do the lobby and then they always come up with the, uh, the uh, some sort of their own policies that are you know that like self regulation and they have the best you know the the, the lawyers the legal advisor that they have hired because they have big money so the uh, so they always go for the lawsuit and they uh, yes they are you know always the target is to make money to make profits and these industries always also fund with the uh, to the scientists to create a pseudo science to misinformation you know the uh, the the false evidence so for, even in covid 19 i am sure you guys have already you know the so many information how they have funded some friends you know the the professional to uh, to uh, to to dig out some information about the relation association between covid 19 covid and uh, the smoking so there are many uh, the ways that you know the industry trying to uh, manipulate the whole pro, uh, policy process not only in the development phase but also in the implementation monitoring and evaluation phase in some countries uh, i'm sure they, uh, they do also you know they provide the uh, the uh, scholarship to the medical students or some any other you know the the uh, form of the scholarship they have and they are we are, we have noticed they even in the covid 19 times the uh, the industry the big tobacco the alcohol the soda the food industry they they do the partnership with the governments and also some international the uh, health organization i would say here for example the coca cola is really has a good uh, you know the the partners with the uh, the red cross international red cross and red cross and the governments with the especially ministry of health coca cola the red cross and ministry of health and you know they all are the the, the good partners so called good partners so you know there is some really the big conflict of interest even within the the some the health community and also uh, the government sector so uh, they, these all thing i'm saying here because we need to we need re- be really serious we are repeating these uh, you know the figures for almost a, uh, i don't know decades with the numbers maybe the uh, you know the so be different but the, the the problem is growing each and every day and all these four big uh, industry you know they they are accountable they are responsible of almost more than uh, around 55% of the total non communicable disease deaths so it is estimated about 41 million people die from the non communicable disease of these day more than 55% actually uh, is is uh, uh, is because of the big tobacco big alcohol big soda and big food so these all deaths can be prevented but what needs to be done so i would like to just quickly highlight what needs to be done to avert or to prevent this death the first is really accountability when i as i mentioned earlier Now our health if you look at our the you know that our health it is start from individual to the community or to the global community from here they are home to the you know uh, uh, the also they have to go uh, home to international level so or it's a global level so everyone has a big responsibility and accountability so particularly in this case when we talk about the industries or companies and we know the the uh, they can be only you know the regulated they can be only isolated they means the all this uh, the big uh, you know the, the harmful companies the harmful industries 
for this, the government should be really accountable. Government should come up with the strong rules, regulation, policies. And once they have those uh, the strong policy, they should be implemented and forced to really, uh, you know, the, the, the limit the, these industries, the, the activities. At the same time, like uh, the, uh, the, what we also mentioned earlier, it's also time to really make these industry liable and also responsible all these debts. So who can do this? We, how? Through the, uh, the good regulations, uh, the, uh, the policies as for the best practices, uh, whether it's at the national or subnational level or international level. The third point is I would like to also highlight here media as accountability. Media has played a big role uh, in, in our society that we know. And media has an easy access as much as the, the industry has. You know, media can, and the, when I say the easy access, easy access to the policymakers, easy access to the people, easy access to the any, any segments in our community. So media has an equal uh, the, 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 uh, the, the opportunities or the access like uh, the, you know, the, the industry do. So uh, the, um, in this case, uh, we, we see uh, you know, every day there are some media always trying to promote the industry's activities in our community. The media also plays a bigger role to really position this industry as a, as a good industry, as a responsible industry to our people but actually not. So uh, we, we really need the media should be also accountable. Media should uh, really uh, should, you know, the identify whether uh, the, uh, the industry's activities are in favor of the good health or not. So there are many ways. So uh, I hear, I'm really sorry. So whoever here, yeah, I know I'm not just, you know, the, the uh, talking about you, I'm talking about at, at all the all medias. So the, if media change or their, you know, the, the ways of thinking and the, the way they frame the different stories and share the information to the people or the policymakers or the, the, uh, the implementers, there should be always the positive, you know, the, the framework. The second point is uh, when we talk about the, uh, the uh, policies and the programs, uh, one of the effective policies is that uh, taxation and price. But when we talk about tax and price on these uh, the, uh, product, yeah, in the alcohol, tobacco, soda, food, all these things, always there is an issue. Governments always think, oh, or the uh, C, you know, especially Ministry of Finance, the, uh, if we look at this industry as a source of revenue, as a source of income, and also at the same time, uh, our, we know our politicians, they are belongs to different parties and they have to go for the election. On a, you know, they, and all, and they see, you know, for their political parties, even for them uh, as an individual level, they see they're also the uh, source of their revenue for their uh, election campaign and for other things. Because of all these things, uh, the industry interference or uh, is a huge, in, you know, you know, in, in policy developments related to tax and price. It's happening in many countries. So we have been trying you know, to increase the tax in many countries uh, in our region, for example, you know, even in, uh, in the Philippines, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, Nepal, and other many countries, but we haven't got success. But we repeat, we need the taxation, we need the taxation, but always industries play the bigger role to influence the policymaker. So here, uh, you know, to have a better taxation and price, what we need, we need actually, again, the first point, governments. So we need to really make governments accountable, industry liable, and uh, the media's uh, the, the responsible role to have, to advocate or to, you know, to inform the policymaker for better uh, or effective tobacco taxation and or price or effective alcohol tax or price or any or in other the harmful products. So at the same time, so we need to have also a strong non-fiscal measures. So it, these are very simple. Uh, you know, the, the government should make the uh, complete ban of the advertising of tobacco or alcohol or you know, Coca-Cola or Pepsi or junk food, all, all those things. There should be no any types of tobacco advertising or alcohol advertising. They should be completely banned 
So what do how we need, you know how, you know the what are the key ways to do this is actually again the policies, government's programs, government practice, government's the the actions. All those things are really needed. That uh, other point is uh, we see you know the the health when we talk about health it's always there is a the, the issue of awareness we need to build the public awareness uh, to really inform our people that it is all these products are harmful so how can we do this again through the good regulation uh, re regarding the health warnings health uh, you know the, the uh, leveling so it can be done in uh, many ways uh, for example in uh, in, a, in, a to in tobacco so we, we are promoting the plain packaging which is very effective ways to really inform the the people about dangers of to tobacco and also at the same time that would really help to denormalize the tobacco in our community so uh, that, that means that would really help to prevent the youth and our children to pick up smoking the same thing for the alcohol and soda and also the food so there are some initiative going on in some parts of you know the, the world uh, to have the better health warnings, strong health warning on alcohol, soda, and food. What happened? Just I would like to share here, you know, the, how industry plays a big game here. So when we talk about the health warnings, uh, I think two three years uh, in, in 2017. In 2017, in Nepal, just as one example. The Ministry of Health, uh, you know, the, the, the came up with some sort of uh, the Ministry of Health regulation uh, regarding the pictorial health warning uh, on the, uh, the alcohol products. So the, at that point, the, the Ministry of Health proposed the 75% pictorial health warning on alcohol products. But what happened at that time, the, you know, the, the political stability was not there in, in Nepal. So it's still not there. But uh, that was at that time uh, frequent uh, almost every six months or nine months governments were you know the frequent changing there. So one health minister you know came up with this regulation, and then what happened? The industry the, uh, after nine months there was another government, a new health minister. The industry really worked with the, the alcohol industry worked with the that health minister and completely you know the the uh, delete that provision. Uh, even the the whole the regulation disappeared completely. So it's such, you know, that they play such a big role. The industry interference is really something that we need to pay really attention. Uh, that is just some example. So we, the other thing is we need to uh, have a good regulation. The government should come up with good regulations and the policies to really restrict, uh, you know, the sale of these products. Uh, that is very important and we need to create a healthy environment for example smoke free environments and alcohol should be also restricted and there should be uh, some regulation when it, uh, and where it should be you know the, the used or consumed uh, there should be some sort of regulation so the, uh, the another point is uh, I, I think uh, the the Bobby already highlighted I, I was also talking on those industry the interference uh, we need to, you know, the, prevent the industry, the, the manipulation or interference, their lobby, their everything, whatever they do through the strong governments or the, through strong policies or program or law. For example, in, in tobacco control, we have the already the FCTC uh, framework convention on tobacco control already. So the, the article 5.3 of this convention clearly, you know, they mention that the governments should be transparent, the governments should be responsible and accountable while dealing with the tobacco so they but it's not implementing the governments even you know that they don't uh, they don't uh, care about this in many many in many governments uh, around the world there is for example even you know they uh, just would like to connect the, the TV is one of the biggest so yeah it's a huge tuberculosis is a huge problem and then there are, there are many other risk factors. For example, the alcohol is one of the big risk factors for tuberculosis. Smoking is the second big uh, risk factor for tuberculosis. Uh, uh, of course, the uh, other, you know, the, 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 there are many other factors as well. But what is happening now is, uh, uh, you know, the, how the industry playing the game, the alcohol industry is actually uh, partnering uh, with the Global Fund for TB, HIV, and malaria. See, you know how the how the industry is trying to 
position themselves in a, uh, in, in a global uh, the public health initiatives or a global uh, platform. So uh, there, there, there are, you know, it's not happening in, a, you know, there are many UN organizations as well. Still, they do have the partnership with the, uh, some, uh, you know, food companies, even the, some soda companies, even with the alcohol. I don't want to name here, but if, if you look, visit the, you know, the UN or the website and different agencies, you can see clearly there. So the industries are playing, uh, you know, the big role directly and indirectly from the different source. When we talk about that, uh, you know, the uh, TB control programs, when we talk about the tobacco control programs, industry always behind. And their front groups are not only the, you know, the like workers, the farmers and all, or the, their front groups are also some donors as well. For example, when we had the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, some of the movements about tobacco control or pictorial health warning in Myanmar, uh, it was back at uh, some point in 2016 and 17. At that time, so I would like to really you know, put here, there, there's some in intervention from some bilateral agencies. So it's, it's something, you know, the, how the industry are really trying to get the support from the uh, bilateral organization as well. So uh, we need uh, really a comprehensive where the, the, the policies at the national and subnational level to prevent the industries, the, the activities. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, then uh, uh, the last point, but uh, it's not least, we have uh, several global commitments, like for example, FCTC, we have SDGs, we have the, you know, the, uh, the NCD plans, uh, the strategy 2025, there are, there are the NTV strategy. There are many, the, you know, the global commitments are there. And if you just look at the, the, all these global commitments, and it, it uh, and when we, you know, go through all these things, it looks like oh, the world is now healthier. But in reality, those are the global commitments. Uh, I haven't been well translated into action. Because the, uh, the, the big gap that, uh, you know, the while we do uh, uh, global communities or global leaders while well, they identify the, uh, the, some, uh, the direction, policy directions, there is, they don't talk about how to implement, enforce those, uh, the, the policy direction uh, on the ground or at national and subnational levels. That's the big gap. So it means there should, while, you know, the developing the, any policy, there should be uh, also the big components to ensure that those uh, the policies uh, the, the, uh, will be well uh, the implemented. So in this case, uh, we have seen, uh, you know, the who can play the big role in implementation is uh, local leaders. Local leaders means here, I would like to uh, highlight the, the local mayors. The mayors uh, of the cities is uh, responsible for overall developments uh, including the health for their people in that jurisdiction. So the union, the initiatives, uh, you know, that we started in 2016, uh, through working in the Asia Pacific with the different mayors and the uh, the uh, APCAT that we call Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Health and Development, it was established in 2016, and with the 12 uh, the cities, 12 mayors, and now it has been expanded to almost 80 cities in the region. So this is right, like uh, the, the goal of this, uh, the, you know, the epic field to consolidate the, all the political wills, to consolidate the all best practices, to consolidate the lesson learned and share those lessons learned to other uh, mayors or the cities or policymakers, both at the national and the subnational levels. Just to, in, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, bring together, you know, bring together our common issues. To address these are uh, all uh, you know the problem because of the big tobacco, big alcohol, big soda, big food. So this alliance is really working uh, in in many cities, as I mentioned, and some good examples the the progress that we have seen from uh, from this uh, network is one of the the, uh, the city in Indonesia. The, in Indonesia, actually, there are many cities. The good example is from Bogor city. The mayor of Bogor, you know, there was a lawsuit by the the tobacco industry uh, front group. Uh, the Indonesian, uh, the union uh, uh, retailers or something uh, to, 
to the and they sue the, the mayor of Boga because uh, the mayor of Boga, you know, they came up with the regulation to ban the uh, uh, display of tobacco product at the point of sale and also ban the use of the, the, uh, the e-cigarettes and, uh, and, and other any type of products in public places and over process. So the industry sued them, sue him actually. And but uh, yeah, you know, and uh, the industry not only show him, but uh, the industry try to get the support from the national ministries, the national ministry of law and justice, the national ministry of uh, you know the uh, uh, national national ministry of home affairs, the ministry of uh, the trade, the ministry of industry. So industry actually they try to uh, gain the support from those ministries to you know to influence the the uh, mayor's decision in. Boger city, but as a, as a mayor, he actually the, he stood up. He said, "This is something the good for the health." So he, if the if he if he lost the case from the court, then again he said he has a power to make another regulation to ban. So he is commitment for harm. Therefore, the, or, the luckily the the you know the, he won the case, uh, and then the uh, uh, he didn't listen to the national ministry. Finally, the national ministry also appreciate his, uh, you know, the initiative as well. So there are some good examples, and and he learned this, you know, how he learns uh, in uh, from Singapore uh, when he came first uh, for this meeting in Singapore in 2016, and he saw, you know, the governments, the the the, the policy in Singapore to ban the display of uh, the, all these products at the point of sale, and he was very impressed. And once he I went back to the, his city in Indonesia. He uh, quickly, in in three months, he came up with this policy and well implemented. So this is uh, the good platform where the you know the leaders can share, observe the uh, the good practice in public health programs, uh, so including the uh, preventing the death or the uh, denormalizing the these uh, you know the, all these products, and also uh, actually that to end the you know the all the the uh, all these products in in our community, our societies, by uh, making a good regulations, policies, and ensuring that those policies and everything is uh, well implemented uh, at the city level. So we see this, uh, you know, the the local actions are really important. The cities, their leaders, they know their local settings, they know the issues, they know the problems, and also they know how to solve the the, uh, the local problems. So the local resources as well. Uh, this uh, the alliance, the Epic Act is growing. Uh, uh, we, you know, the, we we are trying to maximize the impact uh, to prevent these uh, the the deaths uh, from at, at least from these all three uh, four big uh, you know the determinants. Uh, hopefully, uh, I would request here all the you know the media and the the, uh, the participants. To have the similar, uh, you know, the approach in other countries and other region as well. Please, uh, the wherever you are, uh, you know, uh, you can play the big role. Uh, the, the health is not the government's responsibility. Now it is also our responsibilities. If you are, as I mentioned, uh, it, it starts from our home. So since we are in a home, let's make our home healthy. I know since if we are in, in the public places, workplaces, let's try to make those places also healthy. So every step really counts and everybody can play a big role in really creating the healthier environments uh, and preventing all these uh, the deaths. So I would like to thank uh, the uh, Sova. I, uh, I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Baum. And thank you for pointing out that health is a shared responsibility, starting from the family and then moving upwards. And also thank you for pointing out the nexus between industry and government, as well as the health sector. And as you have pointed out clearly that an estimated 41 million people die every year from NCDs alone. And a little more than 2.7 million people have died so far from COVID-19 outbreak as of March 20. So I'm not saying that those deaths should go in vain, but other diseases are equally important and we cannot lose track of other diseases in our 
quest to just quell COVID because each one has to be dealt with appropriately. So thank you very much for that. And also as some, uh, there have been some comments that the government should know what is actually the cost of these diseases and what is the cost of tobacco use because it always cites the example of that they are revenue earners. So I think Soumya Gupta and uh, uh, Polly Kabia, they have said that presenting a cost benefit analysis of income and health cost would be one of the information could be, which could be presented when lobbying with governments. And uh, as we know that uh, over 1.4 trillion US dollars uh, are the cost to the world's economy every year. Uh, because of tobacco use. So perhaps such sort of data, uh, more of such data is important to be presented. Would you like to say something on that? Uh, th thank you, uh, Sova. Yes, uh, we need uh, more, uh, of course, the economic, uh, you know, the data, uh, and there are some data is already available. Uh, you know, the, we know the, in the because of the tobacco use, there is a significance, uh, the, the loss in the, uh, actually at the, at the, at, the, at the government sector, at the public sector, as well as the, at the private sector also. Uh, it's a big, uh, for example, in Indonesia, you know, the, the, the healthcare uh, cost, actually including out-of-pocket money, you know, the, is uh, nine times bigger than the, you know, the, uh, the, the revenue that the government generates. So it's a huge cost for governments, huge cost for the family, huge cost for the individual as well. But here I would like to say, you know, data is there. Evidences are, I think, I don't see there is any issue of evidence at this moment. But here we need to really make the governments accountable. They, they know everything. Uh, you know, the, everybody knows. You know, there, there are it's, uh, tons of the evidence. But how to really open their eyes? They are deep, actually. We need to, you know, that do some better treatment so that they can open their eyes and, uh, they, and they can hear us. So it's not happening. So it means we, as a, uh, I think the, the, here I, there is a bigger media group. We, as a media and all, we need to really make these uh, the both governments and national and subnational levels accountable. That is the key. Uh, so otherwise, you know, they are, look at the, the evidence that we have in in a developed settings or in developed countries. It's a huge, and of course now we are, we, we are in, a, in now at this point. There are also several evidence in the uh, low and middle income countries as well. But when we present those uh, to the policy maker, they don't listen. That is the, the, the issue. It's because of the corrupted political system. That's the, uh, you know, the, because of the, uh, they see only their personal or their group benefits. They don't, the politicians that we have at the moment in many of their developing settings, they are not accountable to the people. So that's the reasons, you know, that the days are still they, they, they happening. I'm sorry to say, but that's the reality. Right, right. You are, you are very right, Dr. Baum. Okay, thank you very much. And now we move on to the last segment of our workshop for today, a roundtable discussion on the challenges and successes in ensuring health for all in Asia Pacific. We have a formidable array of panelists from different fields to share their experiences. I welcome Abia Akram, Chairperson, National Forum of Women with Disabilities in Pakistan. Kethi Vin, Regional Coordinator of Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers from Thailand. Roshan John Joseph, Trade and IP Analyst from MSF. Uh, Krishna Murari Gautam, Founding Chairperson of Aging Nepal. Dr. Pooja Ramakant, a breast cancer specialist from India. Kalpana Acharya, Chief Editor of Health TV Online, Nepal, Nurul Islam Hasib, Special Correspondent, Bangladesh Post, Dr. Dr. Thwe, Editor, Health Digest Journal, Myanmar, and Padam Raj Joshi, Editor of Health Today Magazine in Nepal. Kalpana, Nurul, Dr. Thwe, and Padam Raj Joshi are also founding members of APCAT Media. My humble request to all the roundtable panelists to please stick to your time of three minutes, sorry, five minutes for each and prove that small is beautiful. I first invite Abhya Akram. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Shobha, and thank you to all the organizers for having me in this important panel. The presentations in the morning we have heard, it's really like overwhelming and there's a lot of information which are related to all the people of the Asia Pacific and how we can make sure the inclusion and accountability of the different of the governments and how we can see a world which is better and accessible for everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just briefly talk from the perspective of persons with disability and women and girls with disability because we know like 10 to 15 percent of the total population are persons with disabilities and 50 percent of them are women and girls with disability and more than 80 percent are living in the rural areas which is still a huge number. And um, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have witnessed like they are experiencing law of discrimination and the health problems. We, right after the COVID response, we started the uh, discussions and organized some con consultations with women and girls with disability around Asia Pacific and tried to just to discuss what they are like facing a lot of barriers of communication. They are already facing the infrastructural barriers um, and at the same time, the policies and the legislation. But with the COVID, we can clearly identify the sustainable development goals are not on the track because completely the health issue is so visible. Women and girls with disability has identified the largest problem of the cycle social problems, gender-based violence, sexual health and reproductive rights of women and girls with disabilities were really affected them. Um, like they were there were few women with disabilities who were going to the normal like health checkups for their spinal cord injuries for their other disabilities and once the pandemic happened the opds were completely um like closed down and they were not getting the basic services or the health checkups and it increased their bad health conditions few of the women with disabilities they were saying like because of the low lockdown uh, they were not getting the personal assistance services because they have family members who are older and have more vulnerable to get the COVID. So that's why they were not able to get their personal assistance services at home. And for to go to the washroom, having water, all these things were so complicated for them. And the other challenge they find out like during the COVID situation when the non-disabled people also stayed back, back at home, they were having the gender-based violence and harassment and the sexual harassment and there were no place to report that or get advice on that. For the vaccine or COVID uh, testing, they were not able to go to the locations where they can get test their cells tested. And we tried to develop uh, some telehealth services for them. But again, the services which government or the state are providing, they are not access uh, accessible for them. They were not having the sign language interpretations. They were not getting all the informations in the accessible formats for the blind people. The, uh, the readers were not available for the deaf people. The interpreters were not there. And uh, for the physical, like going out for a person with disabilities, it was so challenging to go there. So what we did, like we just tried to negotiate with the government, with different departments, how they can provide that support. The good thing is happened like during this one year, we got the first ever legislation on the rights of persons with disability in Pakistan. And that was on the based on the human rights perspective, they talk a little more about the inclusion of persons with disabilities from the mainstream uh, perspective and talking with different departments, how they can make their policies more inclusive. But again, the process was so slow and then the implementation, they need to engage 
directly the disabled people organizations and we developed one mobile application which was providing all that information in accessible formats for example sign language video audio all that uh, format so people can un at least get some information where to go and where to get that access to services now the vaccine process is started but again the same concern for the older people which is like government's priority to have the older people the aging plus 60 but those people were not able to get their transportation which is accessible for them and they can go to the vaccine centers where they can easily get their self vaccinated but still that was the challenge but what we are trying to do on the national and the regional and the global level how we can have a dialogue with different stakeholders especially the un the state representative and i think apfsd and during this panel we can have more awareness about the rights of persons with disabilities and how much uh, important for them to get the health and the services so in that regard we can develop some joint position papers and some joint statements which can provide to the um during the APFST recommendations and they can influence the government and the state representatives like person with disabilities need to be on the priority for the any other pandemic happened or we need to prepare them for uh, different negotiations and how we can make sure the inclusivity and engagement of persons with disabilities in the health system. Again, the data is not available. So that's another uh, reason that we couldn't identify how many of them are living in the Asia Pacific and the South Asia or even in the country level. So this data segregation research is very important. And secondly, um, the engagement of the disabled people organizations on board, that's very uh, like important because they know what kind of services they needed and how they can be included in the whole process. And uh, thirdly, the research is required because when we talk about the sexual health and reproductive rights of women and girls with disability or the psychosocial support they need, how we can provide and what kind of good practices we have in other countries for example in some of the countries we have trained women with disabilities virtually so they can provide the psychosocial support to other women with disabilities in this uh, pandemic situation and that was really useful and uh, at least given them the safe space to talk about their rights to talk about their health conditions and how they can get more support from each other so that kind of virtual peer support mechanism was really important and a good practice but we know many of the countries have already done some of the good work so how we can document that with the evidence basis and then we can propose to the government and see the references with the SDGs and the uh, uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and we can also provide that services to uh, persons with disabilities in an inclusive way so they can live a dignified life thank you Thank, thank you very much, Abhya. Uh, and now I request Kalpana Acharya to please share in five minutes, please, Kalpana. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sabaji, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, well, uh, COVID-19 has uh, impacted the life of people at the global level uh, and countries in Southeast Asia, including Nepal. We all know that as they remain uh, more vulnerable to enjoying uh, human rights and health rights too. It is uh, now very important for uh, all of us to consider uh, the health of individuals. So our strategies should be focused on reviving the health of individuals, particularly access to uh, minimum health care services and hospitals and so on. Uh, likewise, uh, extra care should be uh, given to vulnerable groups, women, children, and uh, chronic disease patients too. As we see uh, in Nepal, many media reports, uh, I also reported many reports say uh, mostly women, children, and chronic diseases patients deprived of the uh, minimum health facilities uh, because of the problems uh, associated with 
uh, transportation and other problems in this COVID-19 period, in uh, this COVID crisis period. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, um, the condition of the healthcare system, if we are unable to address the emerging health issues at the moment, I think the health concern of deprived communities, it will impact attaining the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. So this is a high time for all of us, not for the stakeholders, for us media persons too, uh, to rec reconsider uh, these things, reorient and replan in terms of the resources, in terms of the action to address the immediate health issues. And uh, being a journalist, I must say, media has a key role to play for which priority should be given to analysis, interpretation through editorials and stories. Uh, so I think um, I, besides this, I request uh, with this, I would like to conclude my remarks and thank you so much, Sobaji, CNS group, and thank all for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now request Roshan John Joseph from MSF to tell us something about the IP and trade barriers to health justice. Uh, thank you very much. Can I just quickly share my screen? Yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, can I go next? I'm just trying to figure out to. All right. Okay. Okay. Can. Uh, okay. Fine. Can I invite Krishna Murari Gautam from Nepal? Krishna ji, are you there? Yes. Yes. Please. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shobaji and all the distinguished participants. It was very learning opportunity to hear all the eminent speakers of today. I have a very short story to share with you. Uh, you know, in the context, uh, I'll, I'll just put the context first. In the last 70 years of development, Nepal has almost doubled the life expectancy of its population. But we have almost added 40 years to our life expectancy. But what, how to use those added years for improving public health and attaining the SDG and many other development goals that the country has and the society has. So that questions are still unanswered. So we have added the life expectancy at all great cost of uh, health worker and private investment and government investment in hospitals and health workers and uh, information, health information, and like, like health journalists. And with all the investment we have increased the life expectancy of 40 years. And now uh, I'm talking of Nepal, so suddenly in our Asian countries, some have added 20, some have added 30, some 35, some maybe more than 40. So, for what, why, how are we going to use this great resource they have? We have earned uh, with so much of investment. These older people, as a result, we have large number of older people because of added life expectancy. And these older people are our great resource, or we can say new resource, because they know how to fight disaster. They know how to come out of poverty. They know how to fight pandemics and other ad adversities of our society and life. In long life, they have learned all that, but that knowledge doesn't trickle down to new generation. And that is a great loss. What we have found is uh, uh, of the total older people we have in Nepal, about uh, 3 million, say, 10% uh, of 30 million, uh, but, only 10% of the total uh, older people are 
not able to function uh, because of mental or physical health. But 90% of them are still active thanks to our health services and all that. So they can be mobilized for improving our public health status like tobacco, alcohol, and all that. And also for attaining the SDG goals for which they are the partner, not only as, a, as their input, they are as an input for attaining SDG, but they are also the shareholder of whatever success we can get out of SDG. But we have not seen in that perspective yet. But the one bottleneck for all this realization or the, of this potential of older people for better public health and better achievement of SDG is the illiteracy, particularly of older women. In Nepal, 90% of older women that we have now are illiterate. They are physically functional. They are physically and mentally functional, willing and able to work, but they are limited by their illiteracy. This, uh, this uh, mostly Nepal is a rural country and slowly we are, we are harmonizing. That means new things are coming in our life, like signboards, street names, house numbers, you forms, filling up forms, bills, banking, traffic lights, zebra crossings, bus route numbers, use of technological mobile, this, this computer ATC. So these are the new things that have come to the life of our older people and they are illiterate. So they, in, in, the, in the urban life particularly, when they are, they, because of illiteracy, they cannot be self-functional. They cannot go to uh, write, they cannot uh, go to a doctor by themselves. Though physically they, they can, they could if they were illiterate. Because this is illiterate, the person, the older person is illiterate, somebody active age person has to forego his activity, some productive activity, and support that older person. So we have double loss of productivity of one person plus self-degradation or dependency, increased dependency. You don't feel good to depend on somebody else. So, and that leads to many other uh, negative social values. So uh, we in ne Aging Nepal is a small NGO in small places where small pockets of some municipal municipality in Kathmandu Valley. We have tried to educate those, uh, those older ladies. Uh, particularly we are focused on older ladies because the illiteracy rate was very high and their health was very good. So they have potential to contribute for public health improvement and many other social activity. And uh, generally their life expectancy high too. They live longer. So they are the great national resource, a very mature national resource we have. So in the health sector, they are, uh, older people are natural counselors. <laughs> you don't have to seek anything. They, they will come and start counseling you. But if we equip them with proper uh, scientific counseling process, they could be a more reliable and more creditable counselor, especially it is important now in the after COVID situation or COVID situation we are still in, the second flood is coming on. So uh, with that COVID has, high impact on the negative impact on mental health of people. So counseling is, uh, is in high demand, which is needed. And it is there is a difference between a, a 25 years old person going and counseling somebody or uh, 75 years old lady going and counseling somebody. So there, there comes the question of credibility and effectiveness. They are naturally very good, effective information dissemination. They are work as a uh, uh, counselor and health extension worker. And they are whatever information, if they are illiterate, they themselves, the older people themselves, they don't have access to information, health information, so they cannot pass it on. So if we pass it on the uh, health information to these older people, they, they, they can be a very good agent. This age itself gives them, you know, this social authority. Hey, older person is saying something, listen to him. 
and that we have found very effective in our uh, in our uh, I don't know how to say the word new learners we call them they were illiterate and we we gave them class and they became literate though these new new learners have been very effective in making society uh, prevent uh, in, in their community prevent the covid by promoting the use of masks asking uh, um, community members for frequent hand wash and keeping uh, body distance and all that so these great resource somebody has to or some government has to think about mobilizing this resource plus also for sdg as i told earlier 90% uh, of the older people of 60 plus age are still functional in terms of income so if they fall ill that means uh, if they are non-functional if they have nothing to do then it has detrimental detrimental effect on their health because of again goes back to fall back to tobacco or, or, or alcohol and all that so instead of having this cost by not involving them in any, any uh, social development activities towards SDG and many other social goals we are losing at two points we are losing their expertise their, their, their utility plus we are having increase in the cost of uh, national national cost on national or family cost a health cost so double benefits of low cost if we involve them we don't have to pay as much high to, as, as to the young young people and strengthen ours we have also used these these our new learners well for social biodiv uh, biodiversity con conservation tree plantation for sanitation and also raising issues like elder abuse because it is one of the least talked about and most suffered issue of our society for the older people and these I are newly literate older people have been really very effective in raising the voice to their in their community and also to the higher level thank now, you I very much thank you very thank much you. dr uh, dr Krishna Muradji, we are running short of time, so can I invite our next speaker? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presence. Uh, Roshan, are you back now? With your... Yes, I'll quickly share my screen. Sorry, apologies for the earlier glitches. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, I'll be quickly reflecting uh, my thoughts on how Big Pharma has been dictating IP and trade rules for the last 50 years. So uh, for people who don't know about MSF, M MSF uh, is an independent uh, international medical humanitarian organization. And we have presence over, and we have given humanitarian assistance in over 72 countries in 2019. And we deliver emergency aid to people affected by uh, armed conflict, epidemics, natural disasters, and who are uh, excluded from healthcare. So, uh, uh, I am uh, I am here in my capacity as a member of the Access Campaign, which was uh, created in 1999 to push for access to life-saving medical technologies around the uh, around the world. So, uh, as I said earlier, I'll be talking about how big pharma and big corporations uh, brought in the international IP regime, and because of which we are facing uh, access issues in medical technology. So. Uh, the the birth of international IP regime actually started uh, uh, st started during the uh, Uruguay rounds of the GATT GATT where TRIPS the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights was introduced and uh, from the late 80s to early 90s there was intense discussions on uh, having a TRIPS regime which would uh, have an international IP regime so which was which came into being in 1995 as a result of intense lobbying by the United States, which was supported by EU and Japan. So the basic reason for this intense lobbying was uh, of the big pharma lobby established a pharma lobby to ensure that IP and particularly patent issues be fame of the, to be part of the GATT framework. So as uh, Kate had earlier mentioned that Pfizer is considered to be the architect, architect of this uh, entire TRIPS regime and which mobilized big corporations and made a uh, big uh, made intellectual property you uh, the number one priority for us trade policies and countries which were not falling in place they were uh, the us uh, initiated trade sanctions under section 301 of the trade act which we see today also through the uh, usdr 301 report 
so by the end of by 1995 the the uh, the trade related aspects of intellectual property rule the trade trips agreement was signed which gave a certain minimum protection for uh, uh, uh pharmaceutical products uh, among other things so this entire agreement was camouflaged on us strategy on monopoly over trade and ip developing countries uh did make submissions to consider public interest but public health and other safeguards were introduced very generally and inferior position when and it was in inferior position when confronted with commercial rights so the final draft which was introduced was on a take it or leave it basis and the countries were forced to sign so we have the uh, trips agreement and uh, So, when was that epidemic was going on, which killed uh, six million people, and almost four million were countries, which is very expensive to for to procure for us, and because of the patents around it, the cost of the cost of uh, ARV treatment ranged from ten ten to fifteen thousands of US dollars in that day's money. So we started importing generic drugs to South Africa to to, to South Africa and other African countries to treat more and more patients, and for which we even realized that we could be sued for infringement. So from there, the road to flexibility is to introduce and strengthen flex, uh, public health flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement started. So in 1999, during the WTO ministerial at Seattle, AIDS activists from across the world stormed the streets of US and made their statement on uh, the access to medicine. US had then filed a Brazil um, uh, taken Brazil to the WTO on its CL compulsory license statute and simultaneously pharma corporations in South Africa were allowing CL import uh, were fi filed a case in South Africa which allowed CL imports now the civil society by then uh, uh, has mobilized and demanded and had demanded an increase in access to ARV in various countries across the globe including in Thailand India, South Africa, and Brazil. So in 2001, owing to the uh, civil society pressure created throughout the years, South Africa, uh, the, the South Africa case was in, uh, withdrawn. The, the, in 2001, the WTO ministerial, in, on the WTO ministerial access to medicine was put on the agenda. Simultaneously, in the US also, there was an access to medicine crisis because of the anthrax. And US and Canada had threatened to use the use a drug drug which could cure uh, anthrax bypassing the patent monopoly. So in November 2001, the countries, uh, member countries of the WTO adopted the Doha Declaration on the TRIPS Agreement, reaffirming the rights under public health. So if you if you see this graph, uh, where in the early 2000s, uh, the the originated drugs were costing around 10,000 uh, 10, to $15,000 by well, but after the Doha Declaration was after the uh, Doha Declaration of Public Health was signed, Cipla, an Indian company, was able to produce the drug and uh, give it for one hundred and thirty-two dollars. So, but uh, Big Pharma's monopoly and uh, you know, the wealthy nations uh, ur urged to have more and more monopoly rights didn't stop there. So, with they considered uh, two thousand five as a loss to them and. Since then, they had been they have been advocating for more and uh, more and more IP rights through free trade agreements and other uh, uh, other bilateral investment treaties, which included uh, patent, patent term extension, exclusive broad patent criteria, which at the end of the day would increase the uh, monopoly and uh, and make it difficult for general companies to enter the market. Similarly, during the pand uh, COVID pandemic, when we would assume that there would be global solidarity and companies would come together and governments would work together to end the pa pandemic, uh, we see that there has been a lot of, uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, the intellectual property and trade rooms has been uh, hindering and hindering immediate and future global access to medical tools. IP is actually enabling privatization of public research. We, we saw that there has been uh, unprecedented public funding with no strings attached. In, uh, during March last year, uh, during March last year, uh, uh, the U.S. has passed a, U.S. passed the coronavirus funding bill, but Big Pharma was able to push all all provisions which would which would uh, 
uh, ensure that the uh, end products reach the public. So all the intellectual property provisions which uh, were included and yeah. So uh, the uh, uh, IFPMA and Pfizer have, since the beginning of the pandemic has been saying that IP is not an issue for COVID medical tools, but the reality is something else. We have seen we have seen in the case of pneumococcal vaccines and uh, the case of Sophos movie where uh, even after when the Malaysian government had granted a license for Sophos movie there were trade sanctions by the U.S. We have seen it in better claim that there are secondary patents that has been in existence and at the end of the day it's entering uh, uh, entry of generic medicines. Even in the uh, COVID pandemic we have seen that uh, vaccines of Moderna Moderna were. Uh, involved in IP issues and other suits, only after which they said that they won't be enforcing their patent across the globe. We see that Lopiruto, which was used as one of the treatment drugs for coronavirus, uh, Israel had to issue a CL because there were a lot of evergreening patents that exist and uh, we, we have been facing problems of uh, 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 getting generics uh, into the market. So only after uh, Israel issued a CL uh, last year, uh, Lopi, uh, the company said that they won't be enforcing the patents. So very quickly, so what are the different barriers that we think exist in uh, access is there are various of normative barriers, which include, which means that we cannot be relying on voluntary actions of the companies to, uh, voluntary actions of the companies to uh, solve the access issues. There are, there are limitations in the international IP and trade regimes, which has been dictated by big pharma and big corporations over the year. And of course, there are political barriers, uh, political barriers, there are international pressures on using such flexibilities, even in the mid middle of the pandemic, the US uh, criticized uh, countries for using their flexibilities. And of course, practical barriers because IP should be addressed in an inclusive manner. Not, patents is not the only issue, but trade secret, manufacturing know-how, data, and other issues still exist. So what are the mechanisms that are available so far? Uh, 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 the mechanisms are avail mechanisms available under TRIPS are compulsory license, which of uh, which again is a case by case and product by product and country by country approach. So you have to identify a product. Uh, the, the the country has to uh, grant a compulsory license, but it will be territorial to a particular country. So addressing COVID nineteen now requires a global solution. So what? Uh, uh, requires a truly global solution and global solidarity solidarity to address the issue. A government should try to come up with uh, uh, policy solutions such as, such as mandatory open licenses to enable global sharing, and we cannot rely on voluntary mechanism by the company to solve this uh, crisis. So uh, as Kate had earlier mentioned that uh, uh, India and South Africa are now supported, by over, uh, now supported by over 100 countries have moved in a proposal to the TRIPS Council uh, at the WTO which would give an opportunity to repeat the successes of Doha and at the same time remove the certain limitations that were faced by Doha then. The proposal, uh, yeah, as I said, is now uh, supported by 100 plus countries and it's, uh, uh, and so a, few, a few countries have been op opposing it. So one of the, uh, the significance of this uh, proposal is it, 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 it wouldn't be territorial. It would, uh, any country that you know, want, wants to waive uh, patents and other intellectual property rights can use it and uh, for till the till the covid uh, 19 exists they can uh, uh, allow generic manufacturers to come up with alternate producers but again yeah as i said the wealthy countries are continuing to opposing it except, uh, including the us eu uk and other countries have not yet taken a stand on it so uh, uh, it, it's the right time to push all our governments to back the proposal so that, uh, 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 yeah, the co uh, ph pharmaceutical corporation don't exert their monopolies during this time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roshan. I would now invite Norul to please uh, share his thoughts. Norul, are you there? Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, so my internet connection is not so good today, so okay. better I stop my video, right? Okay, okay. okay. Uh, no problem. Uh, so basically, thank you for uh, organizing this event and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. 
and uh, I'm sorry that I could not uh, follow the event before properly because in Bangladesh uh, we are uh, very busy at this point of time as we are celebrating two historic events, uh, birth centenary of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and the golden jubilee uh, of 50 years of our independence. So, and you know, uh, head of states and head of governments are coming your, since March 17th. Your voice 17 is breaking, to, no Yeah, to <laughs> attend the... Oh, can you hear? You cannot hear me? No, it's breaking in between. I can hear you. Otherwise, it's okay. Please continue. You continue. Okay, oh, okay sorry. Uh, so, uh, coming to attend the events till March 26. So, it's a busy period for me as a journalist also. But thanks the union, EPICAT and CNS. Uh, for organizing such a uh, timely event because I, I think that uh, pandemic is an opportunity also to bring reforms in the health sectors in all of our countries in the region because uh, if you see that regulations and implementation of laws are difficult in our perspectives. The problem is uh, that what I think that uh, I mean uh, for the political government of our region even in Bangladesh Health is not a priority issue since in political debate, you will not find health before any election. You know, health doesn't come prominently. But uh, this pandemic gives us an opportunity since for the first time, uh, we all are talking about health and health system, all political parties, general people, everybody. So it gives us a chance to reform and or launch new initiatives. But the question is uh, whether we are doing that. For example, as uh, Dr. Tara was mentioning about tobacco issue. So we see here in Bangladesh, tobacco industries, they even take the pandemic as an opportunity to exploit it in every way. And because they, they always uh, try to find ways how to how they can break the laws, you know? Because as I said to you before, that implementation of laws are very difficult. Because, and uh, when it comes to tobacco, there are so many issues, so many lobbyists, they are active and they can, big tobacco can manage that. So pandemic gave them an opportunity also. And overall, if you say that health, we have robust infrastructure in Bangladesh from central to remote level, since we have community clinics in remote villages, but there are problems, still there are problems in ensuring services by uh, deploying proper manpower or equipping those facilities with proper equipment. And that's why what happened, you know, despite infrastructural strength across the country. Everything here is very much centralized. People come to Dhaka for treatment of any diseases. And we don't have a universal health coverage. It's a very new topic here. So the out-of-pocket expenditure is uh, very high here in Bangladesh. So, and uh, again, the, even the, as I mentioned about the tobacco, another thing is coming about the like uh, soft drinks, for example, Coca-Cola, or uh, other junk foods. So uh, we, we don't have, it's like for it's just in, in tobacco control, since there are so many anti-tobacco activists or activists or activities are going on. That's why it, at least we have a law in Bangladesh, but we don't have uh, any other law that can prevent this, uh, I mean, soft drinks or Alcohol is also a problem, but it's not in big way in that sense that it's not legalized here in Bangladesh. You cannot sell openly alcohol or you cannot consume. So it's not uh, that, that, so it will not come in the policy level. But what happens in like in soft drinks or other junk food, they can, uh, they can broadcast or publish advertisement in uh, any way, you know. So for example, uh, even 10 years back, one advertisement uh, is, you know, the Horlicks, which was, uh, which is made by GSK. Horlicks is a like it's a it's an energy drink. So you know, uh, what happened? This Horlicks, one advertisement of Horlicks, Horlicks was banned in UK. So at that time, the GSK people said that this advertisement was uh, basically they, it was broadcast there mistakenly. That advertisement uh, was aimed for Bangladesh or South Asian market. So this is very interesting that they can, they, these food companies, they're also uh, exploiting uh, this, I mean, they're taking the advantage of all those loopholes. So I think this is uh, another area where we should, uh, our policymakers should seriously look at 
uh, with tobacco, these soft drinks or junk food companies, they're also uh, uh, taking the opportunity of our uh, system, of our loopholes, of our law, because it's a big market. It's a more than 160 million people market. So I will not uh, continue further. I think uh, uh, I, if I could speak even better, if I could pay uh, proper attention to event. But thanks, it's a very good program. I, I mean, uh, I wish all the best. Yeah. Thank you, Nurul. Uh, Padamra Joshi ji. Yes. 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 Can you please share okay. your thoughts? Okay, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very nice presentations, all uh, the presenters, um, uh, Professor Rishis Masechi, uh, Latin, and Dr. Tara Singh Bum. Uh, all presentation is uh, excellent. And uh, I I think I was, I'm, I'm the last speaker, I think. Many thanks to uh, Subhaji and uh, um, uh, Bobby Ji uh, for organizing these types of uh, fruitful programs. Uh, we are equally responsible to achieve the goal of uh, health for all. Uh, obviously, media plays a vital role in the context of the free tobacco country and uh, eradicate NCD. Uh, and uh, make a uh, healthy uh, society. We are trying to do uh, what we can. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Krishna Muradi ji uh, clearly uh, told about uh, all about the situation Nepal, situations of Nepal, even health journalism also. Uh, is, uh, I, uh, thank you for um, uh, Krishna sir uh, for nice presentations. I fully agree with uh, your view. Uh, and uh, now, uh, the government in, in the situation of Nepal, the government has stopped vaccination uh, program now because uh, of the scarcity of the of OPEX in the situation is uh, now. Uh, and then things, uh, and I think we are going to late. Uh, so um, I want to do is stop uh, my words. I agree with uh, all of your presentations and view. And next time I will discuss detail. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Padam Raji. And you were not the last. And now I invite Dr. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. I, I invite Dr. Thieu to please share his thoughts. Okay, okay, ma'am. Sorry. Yes, yes Dr. Thieu, are you there? Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, all participants. And uh, I'm thankful to uh, Shuva and TNS team for inviting me to give a, a remarks. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Tim Otwe, and, and my pen name is uh, Dr. And that is, I'm a uh, former, and former chief editor of Health Digest Journal, and I retire also. Uh, my journal is uh, stopped now. <laughs> uh, print version is since the beginning of the pandemic, and also the online version is stopped and uh, not available uh, right now since the military coup. Uh, right now, uh, humanitarian rights and uh, healthcare services in Myanmar are double impacted. As you all know, it is impacted number one by the pandemic and COVID-19 and number two, uh, as you all may know, uh, due to the military coup. Uh, riots and violence crackdown of protesters uh, everywhere in the country. Uh, very obviously, and I may need not to say too much. Uh, also, our country changed to parliament democratic government system since 2011. This is not fully uh, demo uh, democracy, as the 25% of authority is in the hand of the army, according to the, without the constitution law. Though Myanmar became a partly democratic country since then, I could say that human rights are deprived of in some degree, especially in sexual and reproductive health and rights. For example, talking about the LGBTQI are still taboo in Myanmar. They are not officially recognized or accepted in Myanmar yet. Now, the community is more worse, as you all know, when it is under military coup. And no freedom of express right now, no freedom of to talk, to write, and even private media medias are also curbed. Even some of 
uh, the journals and newspapers are banned to publish right now. And also uh, some journalists are detained. And as the people are protesting the coup, all the works, the coup, all the works are nearly stopped. The government service are defunctioning now as the workers, including health professionals like doctors, nurses, etc., are under CDM. And that is civil disobedience movement. But health professionals from private centers are giving their services to the people. When we will talk about the health services, uh, pandemic COVID-19 affected on the entire service health system. And almost all of the healthcare workers had to focus on pandemic. People could not get, uh, could get only for emergency treatment at the public hospitals. And people can't assess routine healthcare services at the public clinic. And they had to go to the private clinic for their health problems. As elective surgery cases were postponed at public hospital and they had to go to the private hospital and to spend more money, out of the pocket money for their healthcare costs. Public health centers also impacted. Preventive measures like uh, delayed or decrease in activities. Such your programs cannot be implemented properly or some are postponed. In tobacco control activity, for example, to extend the smoke-free zones throughout the country, that throughout the local regions are uh, limited, uh, no more activity. Because of the limited mobilization, we cannot do launching ceremony or advocacy meetings or et cetera. Because people need to be stayed at home to prevent pandemic spread. So also is preventive measures for NCDS. We can do advocacy meetings and other mass activities like health talk, health exhibitions, etc. Diabetic clinics at public hospital may be pathetic. Not only NCDS, but also communicable diseases, infectious disease control are disrupted. And the most important is universal child immunization programs. These programs are stopped. No more scheduled immunization programs implemented, like DVD, measles, or hepatitis B vaccine, etc. To control program, uh, TB control programs services by government are uh, also stopped. But fortunately, thanks to the some NGOs services for TB patients are still available and they are well functioning, and also. Those TB patients getting TB drugs from government clinics are traced by them, and now they could get TB drugs from the NGO clinic. The only problem is transition of supporting money to the patients could not be done due to the online banking services are uh, also stopped now. The good news I had is that some private clinic are uh, transferring even new to be patients to NGO clinic. So far I know is uh, living person, living H, person with HMV and ENDS patients were could get their ARD treatment uh, up to now. And thanks to the NGOs, some NGOs are still functioning. They can do, they are, they are doing well. They have good communication net network among them. COVID-19 response in Myanmar is, I think it is not very bad up to now. Total uh, positive cases is 114,000 and total deaths over 3,000. But uh, case fatality risk is 2.2%, whereas world case CFR is 2.22%. So it is a little bit higher than the world, world standard. Vaccination for COVID-19 already started since February 1st. 1.5 million doses uh, since, since uh, end of January. 1.5 million doses of AstraZeneca and COVID shield vaccines already bought from India. 
That is for only 7.5 lakhs of people, number of people. And now priority persons who are vaccinated depends on the where there is security is granted or where there is saved. Uh, preventive measures are weakened now. As they are, protesters are moving the mass in mass movement. Though these challenges and difficulties are confronting, uh, we must overcome it by means of all what we could do and what we could affordable, what we could and our efforts. We must have support, advice, and build capacity and strong communication network among us, and sharing experience, learning from each other, etc. So that we could achieve the sustainable development goals targeted by UN. That is all my remarks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Q. Thank you very much. And our prayers and goodwill are with the people of Myanmar in these trying and difficult times for them. Uh, our uh, panelist, Kathy Wynn, who's regional coordinator of Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers or APNSW uh, from Bangkok, she had to leave early because she had a doctor's appointment. So she has sent her written note to me, uh, which she wanted to speak. So I'm just reading verbatim from what she has sent me. Uh, she says, I work for the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers as regional coordinator based in Bangkok. I will start with meaningful participation of key populations, including sex workers, community, and nothing about us without us. These days worldwide and in our region, we are talking and having consultations on universal health coverage and SDGs at national, regional, and global level. Have we had enough coverage or success? I will say no, because there is lack of meaningful community participation and in the development process on key populations, including sex workers community, who are the most vulnerable populations. UHC or universal health coverage for them is insufficient, especially among those who are marginalized due to stigma, discrimination, criminalization, or simply because they are considered invisible. We want health responses and systems that are central to the health needs of individuals and communities, rather than only focus on disease control. We want a UHC that takes an all-inclusive approach to healthcare provision, promotion, and disease prevention so that no one is left behind. However, there have been successes of community contribution and community participation uh, during these times. And these include during COVID-19 crisis on supporting their community to continue to access HIV services, STI testing, ART, sexual and reproductive health services, PMTC and TB services, and support to those affected by the, by the uh, COVID-19 itself. But still, we, the key populations and people are facing challenges in saving lives from preventable diseases. I strongly think that we need to move forward on action that will help with everyone's efforts and participation. We need to be united and respond with meaningful participation if the world wants to achieve universal health coverage and the SDG goals. So that is what she had to say. And uh, I have uh, just a moment. Uh, uh, I have a, a Polly Pongia from Cook Islands. Would Polly, would you like to say something and add on to the discussion? Yes, Polly, are you there? Okay, maybe. Yes. Yes, Polly. Maybe there is some internet pro problem at her end. And uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Pooja Ramakan, she could not make it because she had to go to another meeting. So with this, we come to the end of our workshop today. 
Uh, I request all presenters to please email their presentations to Bobby Ramakant immediately as the deadline to submit recommendations is today. And uh, I thank all the participants for their meaning uh, and the speakers for their meaningful contribution to this workshop today. And let's we forget tomorrow is World Water Day and on 24th March is World TB Day and 7th April is Health Day. And as we have seen from today's deliberations, all of them are interconnected. We know how key is the right to water to human right to health. I'm tempted here before I end and I say bye bye, I am tempted here to share the words of United Nations General Secretary Antonio Guterres, who said that COVID-19 has exposed the lie that free markets can deliver health care for all. The fiction that unpaid work is not work. The delusion that we live in a post-racist world. We are all floating on the same sea, but some are in super yachts and others are clinging to drifting debris. Bye-bye and have a good day. And thanks once again for being there.